Welcome everybody to the next session for learning to hack with Helen, me. Today I have amazing guest, uh, Jennifer Lemon. I know Jen for a while. She also participated in some leading cyber ladies sessions before. And today we will talk about um, application security offensive testing or penetration test. Um, and Jen will share with us some techniques um, and maybe even some a demo on how to do certain um, techniques in offensive application security testing. So Jen, uh, please introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. This is super exciting. I'm super grateful to be able to share all of this with your audience today. Uh, like the slide says, I'm going to be talking about uh, Port Swigger's Burp, Burp Suite. I'm going to use it to demo the OWASP uh, Juice Shop, which is an intentionally vulnerable web application. Um, and we're going to talk about cross-site scripting, which is my personal favorite uh, of the OWASP Top 10. Uh, and if you're new to the security space, these tools are pretty popular with the community, so hopefully they aren't uh, aren't super new for everybody. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I started my career with a little company called SAP, which is where I met Helen in 2004. I was with the product security team or the product support team, sorry, for 11 years. Uh, after being exposed to AppSec through my role in support, I decided to focus on security as a career transition. And then uh, I started to focus on that. So definitely wasn't overnight. I spent about three years doing things like taking classes after work at BCIT. Uh, I did networking inside within SAP and outside I volunteered with my local B-Sides chapter. Uh, I got a SANS certification and then I ended up with a fellowship which I got through networking at SAP and I uh, was able to join the security team, the central security team on a fellowship, which is when I met Helen. And then, uh, yeah, they, that team hired me and I changed roles to focus on open source security and SaaS tool at the enterprise level. So we provided tools for our development teams to use. Um, I was there for about a year and a half, and then there was an opportunity to jump over to be a little bit more focused in AppSec, which is what I really wanted to do. So I did that, which is where I spent the last four years. And then, uh, yeah, I recently joined a company called Wealthsimple, which is a Canadian fintech uh, in January, and I'm senior product support or senior product security engineer there. Um, then there's January. I, uh, I also really wanted to take a minute to dispel the myth that everybody working in security needs to eat, sleep, and breathe security in all of their downtime. Um, I'm a really big fan of balance, and I do. I get, I'll participate in the odd CTF now and again. Uh, the last few of them have been uh, through Trace Labs, OSINT CTFs. Um, on the weekends, I like to work out. I like to bake. Um, I like to talk about security, but I, uh, I like to also hang out with my dogs and my husband. Um, and because I know that folks are going to be asking about my dogs, that is a picture of them. They're on either end. Uh, the one in the middle is their cousin. So yeah, those are my little doggos. And I'm glad that you mentioned the CTF OSINT. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to um, be involved at more offensive le uh, level and learn more about um, that side of um, cybersecurity, right? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, the, the CTFs, there's a bunch of them, um, really depends on what you want to work on and sort of what aspect of security you want to work on. I think actually the next slide talks a little bit about the different areas of security. So like... Why? Why security? Why? Why do I? Why do I like security? Um, it's always been really interesting to me. I'm a bit of a rule follower, so hacking stuff has always felt a little bit like badass or or rule breaky to me. Um, I'm also super curious about everything. I'm always asking questions and just trying to poke at stuff and try to figure out how stuff works. Um, so when like back when I was starting to get into this, when customers were asking about potential vulnerabilities, 
Um, I got really interested in the why and the how, and then that sort of led me down the garden path into sort of like, how do we know this is fixed? Um, which is a really big part of my job, right? When we talk to developers and say, hey, you know, here's an issue. Can you please fix this? Um, how, do, how do we know that it's actually fixed? So that's, that's a large part of my job. Um, I look at security really as a bunch of puzzles and I've always been drawn to mysteries and puzzles. So it's, I don't know, goes back, goes back to when I was a kid. Uh, I feel like there are so many different areas of exploration. Um, like for example, the hardware hacking village at DEF CON one year pre-COVID um, got me into a soldering and building my own badge. And so ever since then, I've been doing soldering projects and, and so that's, that's been a lot of fun. Um, uh, it, it's certainly, uh, and curiosity is one of the uh, main traits of um, all hackers, right? Whether you are white hat, black hat or whatever they are, because without curiosity, you, you won't be able to succeed really. And persistence, of course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To dig, dig to the roots of your curiosity. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Like trying to trying to just tease on that little bit of a thread and then and then see where it goes. And sometimes it's nowhere, and sometimes it's two places you've never even thought. So curiosity is is definitely something that we look for when we when we're looking to, even to hire folks into the security space. Um, yeah. Uh, I also wanted to call out that the security space is also really diverse. So uh, there's, um, I've got a couple of areas that I could just think of off the top of my head. So network security, mobile application, hardware, OSINT, which stands for open source intelligence. That's the, that's the trace lab CTF that we were talking about a little earlier. Uh, social engineering. Um, what other areas can you think of that would be security? I, I think um, um, it's more or less can overlap certain areas. For example, we often can talk about IoT security, right, which actually overlaps multiple layers, um, network, application, hardware <clears throat> as well, right, in IoT. Yep, yep, absolutely. And then you know, you've, if you talk about mobile security, are, are you talking about the actual security of the device or are you talking about the security of the application? And a lot of times those will overlap as well. So yeah, lots of, lots of room for growth and lots of room for exploration. I love it. I uh, wanted to quickly dive into the tech I was going to use today for the demo. Uh, I use a Mac for work, so that's what I'm going to use today. Uh, it's work hardware, so it's not modified at all outside of what IC has 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 done. Um, I'm running whatever the latest Mac OS is. Uh, a lot of people really think that jumping right into Kali Linux is kind of the way in, and it, I don't disagree that Kali is a very powerful tool. Um, most of the work that I, I do does not involve Kali. It, I use it maybe a couple times a year. Looks like you had a question. But but I, I think uh, that's exactly the point that uh, current um, this particular area and the demo that you are planning to show is not anyhow attached to operating system. You can use Windows um, um, o OS, right? Uh, and uh, like Mac, whatever you use, Linux. Uh, so it's really independent in this case. Of course, Kali, you mentioned, um, has many tools, but uh, Pro, uh, Burp Suite Pro, or just Burp Suite, um, is, can be installed on any operating system. Yeah, Freedom absolutely. Think, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, professionally, I use Burp Suite Pro uh, for this demo. I wanted to keep it as accessible as possible, so I used the Community Edition, and then I used an open source um project called G-Shop, which is an intentionally vulnerable web app. Uh, I actually installed that with Docker. Uh, and then I got three quarters of the way through testing my stuff and went, oh no, there's a bunch of features that I wanted to show that couldn't be accessed by Docker. So I ended up going through a, uh, through a, a hosted app on Heroku. So <laughs> surprise. Yeah. So uh, 
that was that was a bit of a pivot at the last minute. Um, you you mentioned uh, Burp Suite Pro and community versions. What are the main differences? Uh, originally, I thought that there were more differences than there actually were. Um, the biggest difference for me are going to be in the B App Store, which I'll get to in a bit. I'll, I'll run through a bit of a, a demo on, on the tool itself. Um, some plugins in the B App Store, which is just the Burp App Store. You can actually extend Burp to um, add plugins to it. And there are some professional level only ones. And then there's uh, most of them are community edition focused. Um, the other one that would impact me is the ability to use the the default or the, the built-in payloads through one of the tools, um, which I'll get into through the intruder tool. Um, the pro the pro version has a lot of built-in payloads for, for fuzzing and cross-site scripting, and the community edition does not. Uh, I thought at one point I remembered that the decoder was also part of the professional version, but I am I was super pleased to see that it was actually available on uh, on the community edition. So, so yeah. So potentially you can with uh, provided payloads <clears throat> in um, in professional version you could automate, or can you write your payloads and automate like um, in a community version? Yeah, you can actually write your own payloads and then upload your own. They just don't have anything built in. Mm -hmm. So more work otherwise, right? A little bit more yeah. work, but <laughs> it uh, you can actually find lists of payloads on the internet that you can copy and paste and put in. Interesting. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I wanted to quick go over cross-site scripting as well. Uh, just a bit of a primer. Um, it is part of the OWASP top 10 in 2021. It was rolled into the injection, the AO3 classification. Um, wanted to, there's, there's three types. There's reflected, stored, and DOM-based. Um, I really wanted to focus on reflected today because that's usually the that's usually the first cross-site scripting vulnerability that people are exposed to. It's definitely one of the easier ones to exploit, uh, or at least it has been um, recently. Browsers have been getting very good, and modern applications are getting very good at detecting and refusing reflected cross-site scripting um, and uh, I also wanted to talk about DOM-based, but I decided to go with Reflected just because it's a bit easier. Um, DOM-based is still worth considering and worth talking about. So maybe maybe in the future, I, uh, if, if you like, I can come back on and talk about DOM-based uh, cross-site scripting. It's the, it's the one that I have the most trouble convincing developers that they, they should fix. So um, it's, yeah. So, so maybe um, just if somebody first time sees this presentation and never had any experience discussing cross-site scripting, <clears throat> in a simple example, um, how would such a attack look like from a, a user perspective or the application perspective? So cross-site scripting really happens when you have a malicious script that is that is submitted to the to, to the application. And when you when you talk about reflected cross-site scripting, the, the the malicious script gets passed to the back to the back end to the server. And then it gets sent back to the browser or reflected back to the browser. Uh, without any kind of modification or any kind of input verification. Um, that's that's basically that's basically what a reflective cross-site scripting is at, at a high level. Um, when you talk about uh, stored or persistent, um, that is when an attacker or someone else by a means of an attacker will submit a a payload, a cross-site scripting payload, and it gets stored. So if you think of like a, uh, a web forum where a few different people can log on and see all of the same comments. Uh, your stored cross-site scripting vulnerability is going to be 
part of those comments where it's actually stored on the back end and then be able to be accessed by, by multiple people. Um, and then DOM-based is really uh, limited to the browser. It doesn't usually do the round trip to the server and then back. It really only, it only happens in, in the DOM, the document object model. Um, and if, yeah, if, if you're just getting started with web application security, you might be like, oh, what's, what's this DOM all about? Um, and it basically, the, the high level answer is it is what your browser uses to make web pages look like they do um, without going too deep into that. So in other words, maybe um, if I can um, imagine an attack uh, using cross-site scripting reflected when it's very specific to user who <clears throat> saw this, maybe this link was uh, incorporated as part of the phishing or something, yeah, and they have it reflected to something showing up that wasn't there uh, intentively by the application developers, right? Um, persistent is when same, um, let's say, message or something is showing up for all users, regardless yeah, of, um, of who logged in first or uh, accessed first the application. So maybe it can be a text or um, a link to another website or anything like that. But then <clears throat> they can also steal information. Can they use cross-site scripting attacks like cookies or credentials or anything? Can they? Yeah, absolutely. It's usually just, it's a, it's a piece of JavaScript that will be interpreted and then run as your browser. So anything that is, uh, that is used and accessible by your browser will be accessible by the script. Um, like I say, a lot of the modern browsers will, uh, will, will employ defenses against cross-site scripting. Um, so we're seeing that a little bit less these days. Um, but it's still, you know, number injection vulnerabilities is still number one on, uh, on there's actually, no, sorry, number three um, for uh, OAuth top 10 for a reason. Lots of low hanging fruit. Yep, interesting. Yeah. Uh, right, so um, yeah, easiest way to defeat Cross-site scripting is both input and output validation. Uh, don't just rely on input validation and client-side validation can be very easily bypassed. So you wanna make sure that you uh, validate all of your inputs and your outputs. All right, so I have a demo. Uh, cross your fingers, the demo gods are with us. By the way, I like Juice I think it's one of the best websites you can learn offensive application security. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, full disclosure, I hadn't actually used Juice Shop very much before uh, before getting ready for this podcast, and it's really powerful. I'm very impressed at how it works, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, I discovered that it was it was kind of a game so you can actually go through and get different uh different 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 achievements so i think i might actually work my way through that just as something to do because um yeah it's it's always good to practice it's always good to to keep your skills up so anyways and um i know that i know that you can install just shop and on, on your local machine, uh, as well as run this website, because they do reset it. And if you want to continue on certain things um, on your own, you can install it on your local machine. And by the way, for the audience, um, I also presented in the past Zap, um, Zap tool, which is quite similar to Burp Suite. So if you're interested to see at the difference, you can go back to one of the sessions in the past for learning to hack with Helen and take a look at that one as well, which will also expand your knowledge around offensive application security. So um, Jen, back to you um, about the Burp Suite with Juishop. Yeah, so like Helen was saying, there's uh, there's there's a huge overlap between uh, Burp Suite and OWASP Zap. I know a lot of people that use one or the other, and it's really a matter of personal preference 
particularly when you're looking at the free version versus the, I think it's a couple hundred dollars US for a professional license. Um, definitely not, uh, not, not something that you really want to do unless you're either fully committed into it or you have work paying for it. So uh, yeah, so I'm using the community edition. Um, I started up a temporary project. I noticed that when I started the community edition, it gave me some options for, <clears throat> excuse me, for um, uh, learning as well, which I thought was really, that was pretty good. Um, I've got actually some links on the tail end of my presentation for the um, Port Swigger's uh, web application security um, classes, I guess, they're, 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 they're teachings on it. Anyways, so a quick demo of the, a quick demonstration of the, um, of the tool itself before I jump into G-Shop. So your dashboard, uh, most of the time, the live passive crawl for all traffic, uh, Burp Suite itself is a proxy, and that just means that your web traffic is going through the proxy before it goes out to the internet, um, or if you're running Burp, or if you're running G-Shop on your local machine, it'll just, the traffic will pass through Burp Suite before it hits the application. So you, you uh, do have to configure that, right? I, I remember from the past um, when I played with Burp, <clears throat> when I worked with it, um, you have to configure in the settings to make sure that the proxy is set up properly for your um, work, for your Yeah, traffic. it really depends on your network. Mm -hmm. If you are behind a proxy at work, um, then you need to set up what's called an upstream proxy. Uh, for for me, I'm just on my home network because I'm working from home, and so I was able to just configure it as a pass through. Other but things then, that you, but but then it, it catches everything, right? <laughs> it yeah. If you so, what you want to do is you actually want to set up your. Actually, let me if I can get. And one point for the audience um, while Jen is uh, looking for stuff. Um, so the Zab that I showed uh, just for your comparison, um, it provides already built-in window where you can click um, and open a website through that app, through the Zab, um, and it already presets the proxy for you. So here um, it's slightly different. So I think depending on what you exactly you want to do, you can... Um, customize your approach, right? Yeah, so Burp Suite uh, actually has a, let's jump over to the proxy tab for a minute. You can actually open the browser, which is what this browser is here. So I've got Juice Shop actually running in Chromium, which is the browser supplied by Burp Suite. Most of my testing in the Pro is done with Google Chrome. Uh, and then I set up, Chrome profiles. So I've got a testing profile, I've got a personal profile and a work profile. Uh, and then I usually use a, um, I think this is uh, Omega, Switchy Omega, I think it is. Uh, and you can actually set up the proxy. So basically what you want to do is you want to tell the browser where to find your proxy and then pass all of the traffic through that way. Otherwise your default will be the system proxy. Mm -hmm. um, because I actually ended up getting this work working quite well with the uh, with the Burp suite built in Chromium. So I just figured I'd use that. But if you are gonna use uh, Google Chrome, definitely suggest looking at profiles, definitely suggest looking at getting a quick switcher for proxy. Um, that's a great tips. Thank you. No problem. Uh, let's see. I got my notes here. Uh, right. So we have the dashboard uh, target. Uh, this is where all of the all of the passive crawling will show up as well. So you've got your uh, I've got my local host, which is where. Uh, 
Docker was running with G-Shop. And then I've also got the Heroku app, which apparently also runs on HTTPS as well. I've just kept it as HTTP for simplicity. Um, under proxy, um, yeah, like I said, so Burp itself is a proxy. Um, web traffic is flowing through it, showing up in the dashboard or under target. Um, you can actually intercept HTTP calls as well. So I'll, I'll demo that um, when I get over to Shop. So right now, intercept is off. Uh, as soon as I hit intercept is on, you can actually see that the Heroku app is actively making calls through uh, through to the internet. And now I've stopped it because that's what the intercept is all about. And then forward that on. And then if you really wanted to, you could stop and like, intercept the HTTP calls and modify them going forward. I prefer to do it a slightly different way um, but this is this is really good to get an understanding of what sort of calls are happening um, and just be able to track them um, particularly if you're making a change you can actually intercept it and then um, uh, send it on so forward uh, forward just means that you're forwarding it onto the web uh, and then Drop just means that you're just going to drop the package. You're not going to send it on. So those calls that you're referencing to, it's every element that it's loaded on the web page, right? Uh, after an, it or is, is the whole request? It's the HTTP request okay. that this application is making to uh, the server. Mm -hmm. Okay, with everything that's uh, included. It, yep. Right. Yep. yep. Either a GET request or a, um, a POST request or whatever other uh, variables they want to use. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. I think that's all I wanted to come to on that one. Intruder is a really interesting tool, as you can actually take requests from here and send to Intruder. So Intruder and Repeater are the two tools that I tend to use the most when I'm using Burp. Um, Intruder is a single request that you want to do, uh, let's say interesting things with payloads. Um, there's four different attack types. I will frequently use Sniper to start and each of these gets uh, it's explained here. So you use a single set of payloads and one or more payload position. It places each payload into the first position and then each payload into the second position and so on. So in this example, this little, this little squiggly line here, I don't know what the actual proper name is, little squiggly line is used to denote the start and the end of a payload position. And so you can clear them all you can manually add them wherever you want. You can tell Burp, I want you to go through and pick all of them. Um, and so that will, when you get over to the payloads tab, this is where you're defining where these payloads will actually go in. Here is where you want to set up your payload. Um, Probably the best place to learn about how this tool works is actually on the Port Swigger site itself. Um, you basically want to, uh, you want, you can load from, uh, you can load from a, a file so you can create your own file. Um, you can paste in your own, you can um, add in. So if you want to say script, you could also also potentially right. Um, so you you have opportunity to uh, upload the text file with a payload already, which might be referencing to 
um, like a Python script to execute something else, right, uh, in the background or anything else that is there. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. I usually recommend folks just start by adding their own and then seeing how it works. Um, this is where you can load in from a third party file. Um, yeah, you can, if you've got a few different, a few different payloads, uh, you can go in and deduplicate so you're not um, making the same requests a couple times. Uh, when you start talking about the thousands of requests, uh, deduplication gets important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you can you know, one payload, uh, simple list, you know, runtime file. You can submit a custom iterator. Yeah, it's a it's a super pow powerful tool. And then afterwards, you can actually define the rules, uh, the processing rules to take on each payload before it's used. Mm -hmm. So you can really uh, customize your payload as you need, right? And I think it's um, it's very useful when we um, specifically looking at some more complex um, cases in not maybe necessary Jewish website, but on some enterprise application when we work with that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I like this tool a lot. Um... Resource pool, I don't usually make too, too many changes, but you might want to. Uh, options, again, um, go through here. You can go through here and see all of the different options that there are for you. Uh, I usually just store the requests, store the responses, and then uh, I always like to make an unmodified baseline request, which is usually marked, marked as a zero, so that I know what the, uh, the it's usually a 200 response, what that actually looks like. So I can compare to uh, the rest of the responses. So that's Intruder. Uh, and then the other one is Repeater. So when I was poking around trying to see how the application worked, I made a request. Um, and this is just, this one's where you really want to take the same request and repeat it over and over and over again. So from here, you can send it, um, get an HTTP 304, not allowed. But if I, this is where I was mucking around with the search. Um, this so actually might why, why would you repeat it again and again, the same request in to um, what cases? Yeah, so your, your different positions, if you, if you think that something might be vulnerable to cross-site scripting, but you know this standard script alert isn't working and you, there are other methods that you want to try to test it, you can test that payload um, a few different times. You can, you can also use Intruder like that as well, but I, I don't know. Sometimes I find that repeater is really good at uh, giving me a request and response right away so I can analyze it and then just make slight tweaks instead of running through an entire intruder process again. Um, I am confident that there are other ways to use this tool that I that I don't use. So uh, do you do you know of any other way to use the tool? Um no, but I was going to ask if something uh, like performance related could be potentially exposed by sending, repeating again and again uh, in automated way, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. Sometimes you hit a threshold in your application and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the automated security kicks in and says, that's it, you're blocked. <laughs> um, this one makes you look like a little, a little bit more of a, a manual user, which isn't always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, extender, uh, I really like extender. So, I'll oh, make this a bit bigger. So, this is just requires Burp Suite Pro, but there are a ton of community, like everything where it doesn't say requires Burp Suite Pro. Uh, you can actually go through and like there's Postman integration. Um, my favorite is retire.js, which is good for 
detecting old broken needs to be updated JavaScript, which you can then use to pivot into crafting your own attack if you know that they're you know using javascript 1.1.1 for example you can figure out um you can, you can take a look at that library and see the ways that it's vulnerable and then test that so is um, it co provided by community so can you add your own b app yeah absolutely you can create your own um, I think it's, I think it's written in, I think they're written in Java. Um, there are uh, extensions, so you can actually add your own uh, if you want to make that work. There's also, uh, you can also make your own extensions and um, yeah, create, uh, create little, little jar files that you load up into Burp and then it will, launch when you do that if you don't want to pay for the if you don't want to pay for um the professional version and you want to try your hand at creating your own burp extension then um you can do that there's also um i think there might also be areas where you can find the extensions that aren't part of the b app store mm -hmm. so yeah super extensible um the last one that I wanted to show you is Decoder, which I thought was originally only part of Pro. I was super happy to see that it's part of the Community Edition. You can type in, you can like get a um, get a string, and then you can either decode it as one of these things, or you can uh, learning to hack the Helen. Oops. You can actually then encode it uh, A64. And then, so if you take that, you can then decode as A64. So you can um, encode, you can decode, uh, you can take hex values. Um, yeah, super powerful. Very happy with this tool. This is kind of my go-to tool for encoding and decoding. That's definitely useful. I I use that sometimes as well. Yeah, and it's just it's nice if you have it on your desktop and mm -hmm. you don't have to go find a uh, find a website to yeah to go yeah through. especially when you do CTF right <laughs> often you have a, a few challenges like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or even you know, saving those saving those payloads. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, right. So uh, I was going to head back to the Juice Shop uh, to demo some cross-site scripting. Did you have any other questions about the Burp Suite? No. Let's jump into the demo. I'm. I would like to see how that works, the payloads, and how it looks on the website. Awesome. Burp. Okay. Um, oh, well, there we go. So, yeah, you can easily test to see if something is vulnerable to cross site scripting um, via just using um, common, common headers, uh, common um, HTML headers. Uh, I did go through and create a login before. So, that is that email. Uh, it doesn't actually validate your email. So super complex passwords. I'll give you three guesses to find out what that was. <laughs> um, so yeah, so when I was poking around here yesterday in Docker, um, I did notice that I actually wasn't able to add anything to my basket. So I should have guessed that there was something up. Um, so what I did in Docker was I just did uh, h1, hello world, So right now uh, you're just trying to see if the header will show up, right? On the website. Yeah, I just, I'm just playing around, poking Are they around. Sanitizing? Oh. Are they sanitizing any? Are they sanitizing? Uh, yeah, where like where is where is everything going? Um, how is this going to be represented? 
Um, yeah, how can, you know, can we actually see anything in the traffic? So one thing that I did was I, so in this screen, you can actually see all of the different calls and then you can also sort them by time request. So I've never been able to figure out why there's no time request there. Uh, I was poking around with it last night, as you can see, um, haven't made any calls on it this morning. Um, and what I would do is go hit search. And then you see that it says, hello world. It doesn't say that there is, you know, can't find anything with hello world in it. Um, so my first clue here is that this is actually susceptible to at least some form of cross-site scripting. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that there was no request made to the, uh, to the back end with this, and which means that this is not actually a true reflected cross-site scripting because there's no, there's no payload. You can actually, you'd be able to see it in the response if it actually was part of the, uh, if it actually was part of the um, response, you'd be able to see it down in here. Um, so this tells me that this is actually susceptible to DOM-based cross-site scripting, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and then to just make sure that I am not completely crazy and that, you know, it's not just taking the input and, you know, stripping off the, stripping off the tags, um, I would probably change that to an H4, hit search again, and you can see that it got smaller. So it's, it's not stripping off, it's not actually doing any input validation. It's interpreting the, uh, these tags as literal. So if we do a, um, if we did a standard uh, script-based cross-site scripting attack, that would probably work. But I don't wanna get into DOM-based um, mm -hmm. DOM cross-site scripting now. I'm also conscious of the time. Yeah, maybe um, next time. It sounds like yeah. a, a, a separate topic for a separate session. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, right, so uh, you can go shopping on this. You can poke around. Um, what I really wanted to show you was under tracking orders. And here's another area, again, which anywhere that you're looking for cross-site scripting or injection vulnerabilities, um, you, you kind of want to test anywhere that the client or the end user is going to be um, putting in values. So as you can see, I tested a couple of different areas here. Um, this is a pretty common payload when it comes to cross-site scripting. And so hit track. And so, yeah, there's the, the pop-up, um, the alert, uh, the alert, the script, script tags actually indicates that you want it to interpret it as a script. Um, and then the alert is just basically the instructions to the, uh, to the DOM saying that, hey, there is, um, there's cross-site scripting vulnerability here. Um, So the if you, uh, sorry, Go ahead. a question. If you want to have a payload executed from the burp suite, right? Would that be um, more as a stored um, cross-site scripting then? You could, it, it, you could do either reflected or stored. Um, let's see, basket items. So this is a... This is uh, this is a payload. This may this may work. This may not work. Let's find out. Um, I want to send this over to Repeater, and then I'll send it off. See what the response is. Unauthorized, so an invalid token. Um, let's get another basket going.
Okay, so that's been added to my basket. Excellent. All right. I am going to remove that, take that out of the way. Uh, right, so I would go over to the target and see if the basket does not appear to be. So basically you're looking for um, this request about load loaded request with the basket, right? Yeah, so where I would probably go with this, and it doesn't appear to want to cooperate right now, um, is I would take this request, go over to repeater, send it again to make sure that the session was still valid. Um, and then you can start um, you can start with the payload. Um, you can anywhere that there is um, anywhere that there is going to be a, uh, a parameter, you can uh, you can mess around with. The other thing that you can do if you're not sure where the parameters would go, you can send it to intruder. And then take a look and see where Burp Suite suggests. So the token, the cookie consent status, you can see what, what values are valuable there. Um, this is one of your cookies. You might be able to see whether or not um, there is uh, the same cookie over time, or if that cookie is actually being used for any kind of session management. Um, you can uh, you can use these these values here. So the product, the basket ID, or the quantity. So if you uh, you might be able to see uh, potentially um, an injection vulnerability in the basket ID, hmm. and so you would drop your drop your script in there and then send it off. And then in the response, um, you would end up you actually get. Uh, you would fire in a payload in here and then you would hit go and then for each request there would be a response that you can take a look at afterwards okay that so in that case so modifying parameters to show up differently for the user right yeah the, you, the results Basically, anywhere that you think the application might be reading the information and then interpreting it. For example, I could potentially modify the total cost of my basket using techniques, right? And make it show up as maybe instead of $100, $1 and pay and <laughs> check it out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll... Uh... I've, I've definitely heard of real life websites where, you know, coupons have been able to been used multiple times. So you get a 10% off coupon and then eventually you pay nothing for a shopping cart or um, yeah, there's the, the thing about the security community is that there's always somebody that has a good story. Indeed. Like indeed. That. So Jennifer, I, I want to be also mindful to the time, our audience, mm. yours as well. Um, it's, it's a lot of information and uh, you shared so many useful tips already for somebody to start in. We, we probably definitely, um, not probably, definitely <laughs> have to look into another session to expand on this material because you cannot just go through everything in half an hour. Um, I wanted to ask you if you had any final thoughts or recommendations? You mentioned some links. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's my thanks slide. Um, links. So I'll share these slides with you. Um, there is basically the OS top 10, juice shop, cross-site scripting types, cross-site scripting overview, a link to Burp Suite Community Edition, uh, web 
Security Academy to go through everything that is Burp Suite, mm -hmm. uh, and then a link for the juice shop in Heroku. And, and I'm pretty sure even by searching for this word, so you can find it, right? The link is um, helpful, but you can still find it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, any, yeah. but anyway, for the live session, we will post the links in the chat. And for those who are watching the recording, um, just search it up and get in touch with us if you have any questions. So uh, if you maybe can flash your screen again about contact yeah. me, Jennifer. Awesome. That's me. Great. I <laughs> suck at Twitter and LinkedIn and social media in general. But um, yeah, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or send me an email if you have any questions. Um, yeah, well, definitely happy to help Thank you. Out. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Jennifer. It was amazing. It was so much information. Again, thank you. And thanks for our audience who listened to us today and was with us. Um, and stay tuned. We'll be back soon again. Thanks, Ellen. Bye. Bye.